welcome to this afternoon's program that is being hosted with the very kind um, support of the Vermont Humanities Council. Uh, I am with the Montpelier Historical Society. We're co-hosting with them. Um, I want to welcome you today to celebrate the celebration of the efforts of Vermont women and pay special homage to those of Montpelier's women in the national. I am Catherine Ware. I'm the treasurer of the Montpelier Historical Society and a Montpelier native. I'm also the daughter of Paul and Claire Ware, who uh, have also Montpelier natives and have been active um, in many local organizations over the years and I think are more familiar to people than me. Um, so I just want to spend a quick minute to tell you about the Montpelier Historical Society and, and what we're up to. We are active again after many years of inactivity. Uh, we're running strong. We have a board of 12 members chaired by Montpelier native George Edson, whose father, uh, Lando, ran the Cross Baking Company for a number of years down in the area where kind of where city center is now. Uh, we got started last year with a public, a public historical show and tell event in May. It was right here. Um, and some of the other events that we have hosted or co-hosted included the launch event for the Common Cracker exhibit, which was held down at the Vermont History Museum. Um, and the Lane Shops display, which I think is still continuing right now, it is on view in the front showcase at Walgreens. It's uh, lots of different artifacts and photos to talk about the historical um, Lane Manufacturing Company here in Montpelier. This year, uh, we're going to be hosting another historical show and tell. It's going to be May 27th, right here at the Senior Center. We're going to be having, again, local businesses and institutions that will be exhibiting and speaking about their history in Montpelier. Um, we have not confirmed all the exhibitors. We know that Mary Leahy will be here to talk about her family's uh, Leahy Press, which uh, has been running, it's still in existence, um, running for about 80 years. Um, and George is going to be speaking a bit about the history of the Lane Shops, so if you've seen that display, you can get a little bit more of the story. Uh, later in the fall, we're hoping to do a public walking tour of Green Mount Cemetery. That is still in progress and um, coming together, and that will be probably in the fall. Um, we are eagerly seeking members uh, to sustain the activities, so I would invite you to pick up a membership form on the podium. Um, and on the table, and you could, or you could join online on our website. It is uh, also listed on the cards and on the membership form. Um, and we're looking for volunteers who might be interested in some aspect of the history of Montpelier. If you've got a particular thing you'd like to research or start a project on or join something that we're planning on doing, we would love to hear from you. Um, email address on the cards. Um, and we would welcome your participation. Um, now, Linda Radke. Uh, Linda is a classically trained singer. She's a member of the Vermont Professional Vocal Ensemble of Counterpoint, the Oriana Singers, and the Arioso Chamber Ensemble. And if that wasn't enough, she also produces the Choral Hour on Vermont Public. Prior to that, she hosted a similar program for the all-classical WCVT radio station, which I loved in Waterbury. I still miss that station. Um, Linda was a Vermont high school teacher uh, for 31 years. She has a special interest in local history, and she enjoys doing research on each town she visits with her programs. She's traveled extensively throughout Vermont, bringing both entertainment and awareness for her audiences of the hard work and dedication of Vermont's uh, women to secure the right to vote. Uh, the Montpelier Historical Society, as I said, is presenting this program in partnership with Vermont Humanities Council. We're grateful to them and we're grateful to Linda and delighted to have her here today. Mm -hmm. There's a wave of indignation rolling round and round the land and its mission is so mighty and its meaning is so grand that none but knaves and cowards dare deny it's just a man as we go marching on. Men and brothers, dare you do it? Men and brothers, dare you do it? 
Men and brothers, dare you do it as we go marching on? Whence came your foolish notion, now so greatly overgrown, that a woman's sober judgment is not equal to your own? Has God ordained that suffrage is a gift to you alone, while life goes marching on? Men and brothers, dare you do it? Men and brothers, dare you do it? Men and brothers, dare you do it as we go marching on? <laughs> so pay tribute today to all the men and women who worked for suffrage, for equal rights, for women and for others. And uh, especially like to thank the Vermont Humanities Council for helping me find all this stuff and Paul Carnahan as well. Stay around afterwards, there is a T, which is perfect for the period. And that first song illustrates something that we always know because of the, our, our sort of rallies nowadays. Pete Seeger said that if you have an audience who knows the tune, half your work is done. <laughs> Everybody knows that tune, you're gonna have a chance to sing along at the end with new words. So if you think about women in their hoop skirts and their bonnets before, war, uh, before Civil War, and then you fast forward to this outfit, which was 1920, you see it took a long time of agitation to get the 19th Amendment. And what I'm interested in is finding out what persuasive techniques you use to bring about social change. So it's called From the Parlor to the Polling Place. And I was thinking about here in central Vermont, how many sort of important community things can you think of that have been born around a kitchen table? You know, just talking to people, and that's what happened in Seneca Falls, where I grew up. Some people got together for tea, and they talked about the idea, not so much of voting at that point, voting was way in the future, but they at least wanted some rights, married women's property rights, uh, say and maybe child custody. And so we owe so much to them, but then what they did is, after a while, moved to the next space from the parlor, and that usually was the church basement, often the Methodists especially, had or were supportive of the temperance movement, were supportive of abolition of slavery. Sometimes they were supportive of women meeting downstairs when there was still heat during a prayer meeting or during a church serve after a church service. So that's where some of the ideas got going. Next step, the town hall. And so that meant addressing men. And it was sometimes the women didn't have a lot of leadership training. Uh, maybe not even knowing Robert's rules. And so um, it was interesting to me to find out that the Quaker women were actually pretty good at speaking. They had been not uh, prevented from doing that. And so after the town hall, of course, then the legislature, the first woman to address the legislature was in 1852, which took quite a bit of courage. And of course, the, they didn't really ratify the amendment until the federal government told us to. But, but it was a long haul. And then after a while, women started marching. And they went to Washington, well, certainly New York City and Washington, D.C. Some of them were ostracized or imprisoned or force-fed. We all know about those kind of challenges. And what I was interested in doing is going to the Vermont History Center and looking in the library for the agendas for the Vermont women's suffrage movement. It was wonderful to see. They always started with a prayer. It was an intensely Protestant, especially, movement. Prayer and a song. And then often um, they had speakers from other places. There's a very famous suffragist called Lucy Stone who came up. And people thought she was sort of trying to rile us up because you know Vermont women don't get riled up much. And they did. And so she came. And the other thing I love is you can see in the back all the ads, like free fertilizer from Hyde Park and <laughs> buy so-and-so's new um, tonic for whatever ails you, so you can see all this too. And they basically started in St. Johnsbury, 17 members, and they had 37 annual meetings until July 1921, when they basically morphed into what we have today, the League of Women Voters. I'd like to dedicate each one of these songs to one of our suffragists. I don't have pictures of all of them, but they really come to life for me, especially the ones that are Montpelier. This first one is an early suffragist. Her name was Mary Ware Foster, 1825 to 1913. That means she never got a chance to vote. And she was the daughter of Cyrus Ware, 
He was a representative from Montpelier in the assembly. He was the one who got Montpelier to become the state capital. And uh, she read a paper at the Vermont Women's Suffrage Association in 1895. She was a prominent Unitarian and WCTU, Women's Christian Temperance Movement. And she worked really hard for municipal suffrage. So that was pretty early in Vermont. 1888, we could vote for school budgets, we could vote for municipal things, but nothing else bigger than that. And if you do go to Greenmount Cemetery, there's a wonderful stone to her husband, Joel Foster. And he was the one who was the engineer of Montpelier's water system. Beautiful monument when he's standing there with a fire hose. So do, do notice that, it's really amazing. And get Paul Heller's book about that. So this is a song that reminds me of Gilbert and Sullivan. It's uh, early on, I'm thinking it might, might have been a parlor song because it's kind of, uh, kind of snarky in some ways about what men, how men treat women. And it doesn't speak to specific rights at this point, but speaks to women having a, a say in their domestic life. Is fit for wives to submit to the husband submissively weakly, and whatever they say, their wives should obey, unquestioning, stupidly, meekly. Our husbands would force us their own dictum take without ever a wherefore or oh, why for it. But I don't, and I can't, and I won't, and I shan't. No, I will speak my mind if I die for it. It's all fudge to say man is the best judge of what should be and shouldn't and so on. That woman should bow nor attempt to say how she considers the matter to go on. I never yet gave up myself thus a slave, however my husband might try for it. For I can't and I won't, and I shan't and I don't, but I will speak my mind if I die for it. with husbands to cope with the rights of the sex will a trifle. We all, if we use our tongues but to use, can all opposition soon stifle. Let man, if he will, then bid us be still and silent. A price he'll pay high for it. For we won't and we can't, and we don't and we shan't. Let us all speak our mind if we die for it. There's some wonderful covers of, the, of these old songs here. Often there was a, somebody going around in the circuit singing it, and it's often like, as, as sung by Mrs. John Wood. A lot of this, these women had no names, apparently. So that's been <laughs> hard. <laughs> and um, I was thinking that it was hard for them to figure out how to convince people, people in power, to give up power. That's not easy. And often they did use uh, some humor, some subtle persuasion until the decades went on and they were tired of it. So this next one I'm going to dedicate to a Vermont woman. She was indeed the first woman to speak to the State House, 1852, just a couple of years after Seneca Falls. Her name is Clarina Howard Nichols. Very important in women's rights, but also she went to Kansas, worked for uh, the abolition of slavery. That was really important to her. And where is the Clarina Howard Nichols Center? Isn't that up in Lamoille County? I think somewhere? And it serves uh, women and children. So what's another way to convince people, especially men? If you think about powerful words in any language, one of the most powerful is the word mother. It has a lot of emotional appeal. So the idea is you respect your mother, you love your mother. How can you deny her this basic right of citizenship? And again, like Pete Seeger said, they used a common theme. And this was sung at rallies, giving the ballot to the mothers. Bring the good old bugle boys and sing another song. Sing it with a spirit that will turn the coast along. Sing it as we ought to hear it, spirally and strong. Giving the ballot to the mothers. shall be free. So we seek the scholars from the mountains to the sea, giving the ballot to the mothers. Bring the dear old 
banner boys and fling it to the wind. Mothers, wives, and daughters lend it shelter and defend. Equal rights, our motto is we're loyal to the end. Giving the ballot to the mothers. Hurrah, hurrah, we'll bring the jubilee. Hurrah, hurrah, our spirits shall be free. So I sing this chorus from the mountains to the sea. Giving the ballot to the mothers. I don't know if anybody recognized the song from the Civil War. Obviously, just uh, sung in the in the North. It was uh, sung at General Sherman's funeral. It's called "Marching Through Georgia." Later on, as we worked in Tennessee to get the vote, obviously the songs would change a little bit. So women in Vermont had access to the petition. That's all the power they had. And so every year, women from all different um, communities would present petitions to the state house to ask for the vote. And one of the places that was so important was the women's clubs of every little town. They were sort of places where women could talk about the issues of the day. Often they did humanitarian work as well. And when you go for tea later on, there's a silver tea set that belonged to the Montpelier, belongs to the Montpelier Women's Club. And so uh, also I wanted to say that the black women's clubs in the South were just central to this effort. And they became more political. And one of them is here is Ida B. B. Wells. But uh, obviously this is a, initially a movement of upper class white women who had the time, the support at home, and the money, frankly to do this. And so it took a while for women to sort of look at everyone and reach out to the labor unions, to immigrant women. That's a whole story that I read a lot about during COVID. And I'm sorry, all I got to learn when I was a kid was Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott. <laughs> Still important. So I'm going to dedicate this next song. It's a comic song about trying to um, persuade men. And I'll, this is Phoebe Stone Beeman. Uh, 1849 to 1913, so again, she didn't get a chance to see it past. She was a member of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, the WCTU again. Uh, she was the president of the Women's Suffrage Association in 1896, and her husband was a Methodist minister, so the two of them worked for a lot of these things. I think there was somebody in the Unitarian Church who was very involved in abolition of slavery. And the other thing is she was the niece of that famous suffragist Lucy Stone. She's known for a lot of things, but the one thing I learned about and took inspiration from is she decided, and her husband too, who was a suffragist, to not change her last name when she married. So they called them the Stoners. <laughs> <laughs> so this song is written by, get the names, Miss NBC Slade and Mrs. A.B. Smith. No idea who they are. And the idea, the argument is, if a man doesn't su support women's suffrage, it's going to happen. And so you might as well get on now, because otherwise there are going to be consequences. And there were for the governor of Vermont at that time. I'll tell you about that later. So I have to pay, play both parts. I had been down to Boston, boys, to see the folks on sights. Dear me, I heard such fuss and noise about these women's rights. Now it's as plain as my old coat. That's plain as plain can be That when the women want the vote They'll get no help from me Not from Joe, not from Joe And he knows it, not from Joseph No, 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 not from Joe Not from me, I tell you no No, my girl Joseph, tell us something new We're tired of that old song We'll sew your seams and cook your meals To vote won't take us long We will help clean house The one too large for man to leave alone The state and nation, don't you see When we the vote have won Yes, we will, and you'll help For you'll need our help from Joseph Yes, you will, when you're in So we better help us win You're just right, how blind I've been, I ne'er could read it thus. Tis true, the taxes you must pay without a word of fuss. You are subject to the laws men make, and yet no word of mo. Can you sing out when it will count? I'll help you win the vote. Yes, I will. Thank you, Joe. We'll together soon be voters. Yes, I will. If you all vote yes at the polls next fall.
research that Paul Karna had found from the old Montpelier Argus, I guess it was, about women's voting and the fact that we could vote in municipal elections, but when we wanted to vote for a federal thing, we had to pay the poll tax, which was $6. Does anybody remember when we stopped having a poll tax? I was thinking it was the 70s. That would be a great thing to, to look into. And uh, so they said, you've got to pay your $6 poll tax, plus you have to go before the city council and take your Freeman's oath. So that would be another wonderful thing to keep on digging for. Which Montpelier women took the Freeman's vote in 1920? In Middlesex, there were 18. And uh, a lot of the same names, the old farm families that we have today. And I was working with a ninth grade boy who had some mischief, and he had to do a little community service. And so we went into the vault, got that beautiful book out with the calligraphy, and went to 1920. And this guy was, I said, well, I'll get on the computer. I'll just write the names, and you read them? And he looked at it and he said, what is this? It was cursive. And it, you know, it wasn't that hard. Eventually, he learned it. But it was fun to see that, that any historian needs to know how to read cursive. The other argument that you heard in the last one was the idea of enlarged housekeeping that we as women, our natural role is to keep house, to keep our husband and our children safe, to feed them good food, to make sure they're, sh they're housed. And all they said was, this is just making it a bigger circle. So it's looking at our community as cleaning up the mess that, that men have made. <laughs> and they also said very gently, and we can help you, because that's what we're, we're known for doing. And I'm going to dedicate this to Lucy Daniels from Grass Grafton. Her picture is here. She had property, but she picketed, well, she actually refused to pay her property taxes because she could not vote. So the city fathers uh, took away some of her land, and she ended up going to Washington, D.C. She picketed the White House, which was not done. She was jailed and fined. Then she went back home as sort of a pariah, although they like her nowadays. And she would give each of the girls she saw on the street 50 cents to go to town meeting. She said, you look and you listen, because when you grow up, you'll be able to vote there, so learn it. And I found a lot of settings for this particular patriotic song. And I think this one's the best, and it has a beautiful cover of Uncle Sam and his wife. <laughs> Within the states and nation, there's none that comes so near the heart as Uncle Sam's relation. Yankee Doodle is his name, U.S. is our station. Red and white and starry blue is garbage vocation. When Uncle Sam set up his house, he welcomed every brother. But in the haste of his new life, he quite forgot his mother. Now his house is up in arms, a housewife he must find him to sweep and dust and set to rest the tangles all around him. Uncle Sam is long in years and he is growing wiser. He can say it was a mistake to have no misadvisor. His nephews now have got the reins and looking over their shoulder. Shout to good old Uncle Sam, goodbye old man forever. Now we're here, dear Uncle Sam, to help you in your trouble. And the first thing best to do is making you a double. Yankee Doodle will be glad to join us in spreading the news about of all the land of Uncle Sam's great wedding. <laughs> It's an interesting uh, song because it's a march. It's a slow march. The hems actually went up during this period because women were marching in the mud. And if you're Montpelier, there was a huge march. And New York City and Washington, a lot of, um, a lot of heckling, a lot of violence, but a lot of men stepped up to, to help this happen. And uh, I want to dedicate this to a woman from Enosburg. Her name is Annette Parmalee. They called her Annette the Hornet. <laughs> because she never gave up. Her husband was a Methodist minister. They were strong in abolition of slavery, in the temperance movement, and she worked tirelessly for suffrage, but mostly in municipal elections. Because that argument that we pay taxes, why can't we vote, that really resonated with men who had learned that back in school. And they were both very active Methodists. But the other thing they did 
was work for women's representation on the boards of places like what so-called poorhouses or so-called insane asylums and for factory inspections. They weren't able right now to talk about child labor or to propose that, but she at least wanted, wanted some women participation in looking at that. But she knew about being humorous. And uh, the one I have over, you know, somewhere I have, she had a broadside that said, let's have a big meeting about men's suffrage. Are men ready to vote? She said, well, they're probably too emotional because when you see them at a sporting event, they're just, they lose their minds. <laughs> and whenever, you know, there's an issue or a conflict, all they can think of is the fisticuffs. And women are skilled in negotiation. So that was her sort of argument, but she did it gently. Um, so this is a march, it's called Boats for Women. But they had such opposition, they had a lot of industry owners. And certainly with the WCDU, WCDU it didn't help with the liquor lobby too. So they had a lot of hurdles to jump over. And I found a wonderful newspaper article from Milton, Vermont. Women went to vote in 1920. And they had a local paper. Remember the women's columns they used to have? They had a women's column and they showed what everyone wore. The oldest and the youngest participant in the voting, which was great. And then they said, quote, they protested when they were given pencils for their ballots. Mm. And I couldn't figure that out because we use pencils. All I could think of was that, that they were afraid they didn't trust the men not to erase and change their votes, you know, which you find all over the place, including here. So the idea of the sanctity of the vote, they weren't quite convinced it was going to work. So they wanted to clean up, as I said, enlarged housekeeping, but also clean up the dirty world of politics. Um, a lot of people felt that was too dirty for women. Some of the women in Vermont thought they had plenty of votes, plenty of rights, thank you very much. And but on the other hand, some women got support from the men in their lives. And uh, this one talks about their use of Christian hymns. That was central to the early feminists. And often they used a familiar hymn to, uh, so everyone knew it. Some of you may know this one, it's a Methodist hymn. And uh, I, I'll tell you who I'm going to uh, dedicate it to. Mrs. Robert Bliss, you know the name that, and Lucia Bailey, 1881 to 1967. She had a little late. And Unitarian, again, she went to Smith College. She married Robert Bliss, and he had a clothing store, uh, was a Goddard man as well. And they lived on Summer Street and then on Winter Street, you know, in the meadow. And she was a founding member of the Montpelier Women's Club, became its president in 1919. And then she became, I love this art, she was, became the chairman of thrift. 
Is that a great <laughs> The chairman of Thrip, that's what she was. And then she was 20 years as a justice of the peace. And then finally, she marched with 400 women here in Montpelier. Uh, through the years, the petitions came, and one time the legislature, one house would say yes, then it would say no, then the Senate would say yes, the House would say no. Went back and forth. Finally, they got both houses. And they wanted the governor to call a special session to vote the question, Governor Percival Clement. And he said no. He was an anti-suffrage man, so it didn't, didn't work. And so uh, I want to tell you the end of the story, because that was the end of him <laughs> when women got the vote. And I'll tell you about another suffrage man who became governor of, of uh, Vermont. So this was for the bicentennial. No, not the bicentennial, the centennial. And you think about being in, yeah, 1876, and thinking back on our country, and thinking about the wonderful utopian world it could become in the progressive era. So I just love the optimism in this. It's called 100 Years Hence. politics, morals, religion, and trade, in statesmen who wrangle or ride on the fence, these things will be altered 100 years hence. Our laws then will be uncompulsory rules, our prisons converted to national schools, the pleasure Declaration of Sentiments from 1848. I have some Mormon relatives, and they're great because they do all that research for us. Mm -hmm. um, I remember my grandma, whose picture is up there, told me one other song. I won't read the whole thing because she didn't remember it all, but it was using another hymn, and it said, He needeth me, oh blessed thought, you know, whatever. So it was talking about how men need us, and she first voted at the age of 31 in 1920. She was also a WCT member at Methodist. It made me take the pledge when I was a kid. You know, lips that touch liquor shall never touch mine. Mm -hmm. And I kind of rolled my eyes, because it was, you know, in those days that was the least of my worries. But anyway, <laughs> I wish she would know, I'm wearing her necklace, that uh, studying the, the suffrage movement and the temperance movement. Um, I want to dedicate this next one to uh, another Vermont woman, Susan Isabel Doty Hansen, 1866 to 1955. So she was one that planned this huge suffrage parade. They picketed. They did have a meeting with the governor, Percival Clement, in 1919. They were not successful. She was a president of the Montpelier Women's Club, and her husband ran for a governor on the Prohibition ticket. And she became, he was part of the Women's Home Missionary Society and the Young Women's Christian Association, WCTA. So again, the women's clubs were sort of stirring up women to give them leadership in their communities. And this one is sort of uncomfortable for me because a lot of their worry later on was that or instead of saying, we want our rights, they were saying, look at those men who have rights and we don't. We have that a lot now. There's an anti-immigrant bias. The Irish they saw as drunkards. They said, why should they be vote? And I went to Vassar College. Why can't I vote? So there's a lot of that ugly kind of rhetoric there, even with my hero, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. She didn't want the steerage voting. It changed, but still. So this next one is a Scottish two going to the polls, and they talk about the Irish, and they use two words from the Bible, Gog and Magog, and they were evil. Mm. Yeah, song. If the men should see the women going 
to the polls. For to put down the liquor traffic, need it vex their souls. If we're angels, as they tell us, can we want some polls? That all the men will frown on us when going to the polls. We love our boys, our household joys. We love our girls as well. The law of love is from above. It's that we ne'er rebel. No discharge of Christian women from the war with sin. At the polls with Gog and Magog must our fight begin. Since we Bible marching orders, need it fright our souls that all the men will frown on us when going to the polls. We love our boys, our household joys. We love our girls as well. even in the Christian church about the role of women because you can find evidence for it in the Bible on both sides. And so um, a lot of the, the women in the suffrage movement had a problem because they saw that, but that to say that, that the Bible uh, is trying to squash women as equal partners, took on the Christian church, which was a really integral part of it. So they had a big debate and the party kind of uh, split apart on that. And Elizabeth K. Stanton's daughter, whose name was Harriet, she took on her mother because she was working with immigrants in New York City, uh, the temperance, the uh, tenement people, the women. She said, women in the countryside can find out where the clean water is and where the food is. These women in the tenements have no autonomy. They have no agency about how they feed their children. And Elizabeth K. Stanton wrote back and said, no, they, if they don't speak English, speaking English the way she defined it, uh, and if they're not literate, they should not be able to vote. And then her daughter wrote back and said, I know a man who sweeps the floors and he quotes Goethe in German. You know, he'll learn English soon enough and he could have the same dignity as a citizen. So there was a big, big debate there. And then, of course, a big split came when black men were granted their voting rights. And because Women had worked for the rights of black men. Frederick Douglass spoke at the Wood Seneca Falls. They were told that they needed to be patient, that the country couldn't take on those two things at once, those two changes. And so they said, this is not the woman's hour, this is the Negro's hour, be patient. And of course we know that it took a long time after that. So I want to dedicate this to James Hartness. He uh, was governor, 1921 to 19, he was governor in 1921, so you can see how he got there. And he was a big industrialist in Springfield, but some words, some things I've heard about him was that he actually wanted to pay women the same as men in his factories. So he, he was a suffrage man, and it really paid off when the elections came. So this is another one about trying to convince the men and the idea of the women's sphere. Is it housekeeping? Is it care of children and family? Is it care of community? Or is it somewhat broader? I have a neighbor, one of those, not very hard to find, who knows it all without debate and never change his mind. I asked him what are women's rights, he said in tones severe, my mind on that is all made up, keep woman in her sphere. I saw a man in tattered garb forth from the pub house car, he squandered all his cash for drink and starved his wife at home. I asked him, should not women vote? He answered with a sneer. I've taught my wife to know her place, keep woman in her sphere. I met an earnest, thoughtful man not many days ago, who pondered deep all human love, the honest truth to know. I asked him, what a woman's cause? The answer came severe. Her rights are just the same as mine. Let woman choose her sphere. And you've got to see this word about choose.
choosing a sphere, which I thought initially they were just sort of taking the sphere and trying to tease it out a little bit, but this is let women choose their sphere. And Katie Stanton said, maternity itself should be a choice. And of course, we're still debating that. That was long before Margaret Sanger as well. So I told you that originally they were all women of some means. Uh, they had some relief from the exhausting work at home and some support, some funds. But the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, which was in 1911, really changed their opinion about women's rights. They saw what happened to the women there. And so it really changed um, the movement because they started uh, publishing pamphlets in the, in the languages of the immigrants. In Yiddish, I found one of the songs. And it started to go throughout the country. And New York State was much before Vermont, partly because of that, because of the union representation. So this last one is finally when the women's suffrage movement under the new uh, leadership of the more radical Alice Paul and Carrie Chapman Pat looked at the remaining states to reach the three-fourths three ratification. He said, probably Vermont isn't going to work. Connecticut might not work. Let's choose Tennessee. I was thinking, how did that work? There's a wonderful book called The Woman's Hour that you might want to read because it, it reads like a, uh, like it's, you know what happens, but still it's, it's like a thriller because the women came in from outside, which is always resented anywhere, even this, especially in the South, but also they started to make a, an argument that's very uncomfortable for us to think about, but racism. If you let your women vote in the South, we can override any black votes that happen to sneak through. And we can continue to su suppress that. And the story talks about one man in the legislature who decided to change his vote because of a letter from his mother, who was a suffragist. And they were all meeting at the Hermitage Hotel in Nashville, and men who were for suffrage were wearing, was it yellow? Yeah, I think yellow rose, and red rose for against. And they would go upstairs to what they called the Jack Daniels Suite, <laughs> where the liquor lobby would proc fly them and they would change their minds or they would put three to vote. And downstairs, the women would start, start talking, but it looked really like it was going to be right on the edge. And finally, this young legislator, who's 24 years old, went up and changed his vote. And this next one is about the end of the ratification movement. And at the end, whenever a state came on to the ratification, Alice Paul would put a, a flag over the, uh, the Washington headquarters and sew another star on it. So this is about that. I'm going to dedicate it to somebody. I just went by the Blanchard block today. Lucia Camp Blanchard, uh, 1851 to 1933. This was compiled by a UVM student, so I'm really grateful to them for sort of starting to find out more about local history. She became a teacher at the age of 18. Uh, she went to Green Mountain Seminary, which is Waterbury Center. She was brought in Stowe. And uh, she belonged to the Universal Society again. She married Fred Blanchard, and he had a hardware store. And it was 35 Main Street. So I'm trying to remember where that is. 35. Look at the next time you're on Main Street, see where that is. And she used writing more than speaking. So she wrote to the President for the Equal Suffrage Act. And she organized the big state convention in 1919, which Terry Chapman, Terry Chapman Cap attended. And she also opposed the suspension of the child labor law. That would happen in 1917. Mm -hmm. And so the other thing I want to talk about is one of the women from the original 19, sorry, 1848 Women's Rights Convention, only one of them lived long enough to vote in 1920. All those other early suffragists were gone. And she was an 18-year-old Quaker girl. She sewed gloves in a town called Gloversville. And she heard about it and took, uh, took with her girlfriends in. And then she became actually a, a worker for social justice in Philadelphia as a Quaker. So she was then at the age of 91, the only one who made it. And here in Vermont, I found out a great thing that uh, the Northfield Town Hall was used for town hall, but when, uh, town meeting. But when women were going to attend, the men swept out all the sawdust where they spit their tobacco and then to make it cleaner. And then they put chairs along the sides so the women could sit there. Initially, I thought, well, that's kind of rude to separate women and men. But then I realized with uh, their, their safety and their comfort, it just felt like it would be better if the women were shoulder to shoulder for a while. 
There's a lot of stories from Vermont that I can tell sometime, maybe when we meet after here. Also, if any of you have stories of first-time voters, either new Americans or from your family, I'd love to hear it, uh, as I told my story of my, my grandma. This is, uh, again, because we're in Tennessee, it's a Confederate tune, Bonnie Blue Flag. <laughs> Chinese Americans got the vote, and in 1952, Japanese Americans got the vote. So there's still many barriers to voting, and as they say, hard one, not done. Um, I'm going to dedicate this last song to uh, the woman whose picture is there. She's just beautifully garbed, she has this amazingly noble face. She's in this thing, picture, she's uh, called Mrs. James Esty, but it turns out she had a name. Adelaide McClure Gillian Esty, 1862-1934. And her husband was Vermont, uh, I think, vice president of national life at the time. Again, they were sort of the prominent, the privileged people of Montpelier. And he became the mayor and uh, came down to the state house and went to the Senate as well. And she became one of what they call the Green Mountain Girls. And they were those women who lobbied Governor Clement every year and all, every day to try to call a special session, which didn't work. But then she joined the National Women's Suffrage Association and they, later the National Women's Party, which was the more uh, radical of the two with Alice Paul. And the women's, Montpelier Women's Club, she was the president. And again, the Universalist Church, WCTU. And she was a trustee of the Washington County Tuberculosis Hospital. Wondering where that was, maybe he maybe it there. And she was one of the delegations that met with President Wilson at the White House in 1915. So what happened over the years, too, you'll see this from some of the um, Tintan Alley songs, is that women who were for suffrage became fashionable all of a sudden. Initially, there were pictures of them, and they looked dour, and you know, they had warts, and nobody wanted them, and they were just you know, unhappy women. And then as the years went on, they became fashionable. And this is one that uh, was written by uh, somebody who was working for the same Tin Pan Alley uh, government uh, business that George Gershwin did. And you can hear completely different. You get to be the jazz man finally. Okay. And it has the best title, and the cover is wonderful too. She's good enough to be your baby's mother, mm -hmm. and she's good enough to vote with you. Mm -hmm. So again, using mother, but in a completely different way. <laughs> Else would kiss them away. She's good. 
last song before we have our tea. And again, it's a song that everybody knows with new words. And I can find so many words to this. Solidarity movement, I remember that in Poland, it had words. And we probably sung it at rallies too. But uh, this one is for equal rights. And I'll just do a couple of verses and you get to sing the chorus. The chorus goes, glory, glory, hallelujah. <laughs> As is this a right for every woman to mark out her path in life and to be a saint or soldier or a true and loving wife and fill the soul with gladness and recall the world from strife as we go marching on